It's not given mistaken your freedom. Stand like Hussein and fight for your freedom. Do not confuse this freedom for freedom. One more time, Shabbat. Freedom is not given. Water is pure in essence and can revive you. Water is pure in essence and can revive you. But it can be used to drown you. Fire brings warmth in the right hand, but the wrong hand use the fire. To burn you, freedom can also be used to imprison you in the wrong form. It can harm you. Boundaries, everything has limits and has boundaries. As long as you do not cross those boundaries. Others and claim it's for freedom. Say a freedom, freedom. If God give any sacred for freedom, stand like for sin and fight, stand like for sin and fight for your freedom. Do not confuse this freedom, do not confuse this freedom for freedom. Oh, 
freedom. Do not confuse this freedom for freedom. When Palestine suffered crisis after crisis, where was ISIS and her partners? When Palestine suffered crisis after crisis, where was ISIS and her partners? Israel was closer to them than Hussein shrine, but they spread there like a cancer. And if the world is searching for a cure for cancer, How can you cut the head of our freedom? Say freedom! Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Uh, respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Uh, it is me today, it is me today that is suffering. Uh, forgive me for that. Um, but alhamdulillah, we are here for the third installment of... Uh, after the massacre one, the first, because after the massacre la- runs for five weeks, this is the first week that we're having after the massacre, inshallah, and this is the last uh, segment of that program, inshallah. Uh, so without any further ado, we will hand over to uh, the speaker of the night, uh, the man of the moment, Muruti Ali Nchinyani, bifadl salat ala Muhammad. وعلي محمد اللهم صل على محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد <تصفيق> اعوذ بالله السميع العليم من شر الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على جميع الانبياء والمرسلين لا سيما خاتم النبيين ابي القاسم مصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كان الناس أمة واحدة فبعث الله النبيين مبشرين ومنذرين وأنزل معهم الكتاب بالحق ليحكم بين الناس فيما اختلفوا فيه وما اختلف فيه إلا الذين أتوه من بعد ما جاءتهم البينات بغيا بينهم فهد الله الذين آمنوا لما اختلفوا فيه من الحق بإذنه والله يهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته May peace, blessings and mercy of God Almighty be upon you all uh, As we continue with uh, our topic of discussion and as promised, we were going to speak about us and denominations. How do we as Muslims and how do we as followers of the Quran, the Prophet and his household, look at various denominations and sects? Um, 
yesterday I was speaking about uh, how do we perceive other religions. Um, so one of the questions that was asked to me regarding uh, other religions, because as I was saying yesterday that no, a number of people that are um, of other religions, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Jews, and so on and so forth, will go to paradise if they are not ignorant, if they are ignorant, and if they were not thoroughly convinced, and if the argument that was presented to them or the religion that was presented to them was a misrepresentation, or was misrepresented, was misinterpreted, or was presented to them in a wrong way, then they will be excused. And we said that the criteria is that a person has to be convinced. In order for you to join an organization, you need to be convinced with the manifesto and the ideals and the principles and the values of that organization. So Islam is not any different. You need to be convinced that this thing works, this thing is the truth, and this thing is the right thing. And that was the argument that we were trying to establish yesterday. One of the questions that I received is, um, well, the question was basically, to briefly put it, um, is about Islam, does Islam, uh, so that means basically all religions are truth. No, that is not the answer that we gave. Rather, what we said is Islam is the only religion that is the truth, and all other religions are not with the truth. The only religion that is with the truth is the religion of Islam. But, however, those people that follow the religion and might be with the truth. So, what we are basically trying to say is that Islam is not the problem. Muslims are the problem. And Christians are not the problem, but Christianity is the problem. So, we are saying that Christianity is not a valid religion. To begin with, Christianity is not even mentioned in the book of the Christians, that is the Bible. To begin with, Judaism is not mentioned in the Bible. To begin with, Hinduism is not mentioned in the Vedas, in the book of the Hindus. Buddhism is not mentioned in the book of the Buddhists. They themselves agree that their religion is not part of their scriptures. Only religion in the world that contains its religion in its scripture is the religion of Islam, based on the research that I have done. Maybe I might be wrong, and there might be a religion out there that has its scripture, and its scripture mentions its religion. But so far, the only religion that I've come across is the religion of Islam that has the religion of Islam in its book. So we are saying that the problem is not with the people but rather with what they are following. So people are not necessarily the problem. So if they come to the religion of Islam, they obtain salvation. So we definitely say that Islam is the truth, but however Allah can shower with uh, mercy a lot of people. Majority of human beings are going to go to heaven. That is our belief. Majority of human beings are going to go to paradise. That is the belief that we have. Very few individuals are going to go to hell. A very minority of human beings. That is the belief that we have. And by we, I mean myself personally, based on the research that I have done. So the topic for today is about denominations. It's about sects. It's about groups. And it's about um, schools of thought. So that is why the topic is us and other schools. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is that denominations and sects and schools in the Quran, how are they addressed? Uh, what does Allah say about denominations and how did they come about? Number one, number two, and also are there denominations in Islam? So these are the first few questions that we are going to dwell on. So when we look at denominations or sects and groups and uh, 
schools of thought. This is something that is not new in the religion of Islam. It has happened with other religions and it has happened with other ideologies and it has happened with other principles and beliefs. So a typical example with the verse that we quoted in the Quran, where Allah explains how ideologies and how schools of thought and how different thinking and how groupings occurred. Allah says in the beginning of time, in the beginning for human beings, human beings in the beginning, this is how they were. This is based on a verse in chapter number 2, verse number 213 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, Allah says, Mankind was one. Mankind was one. And then God Almighty sent messengers and prophets, or he sent prophets as bringers of glad tidings and as warners, people who warn and as people who bring glad tidings. So Allah is saying that mankind was one. And then after that, Allah sent messengers who give glad tidings and who give warnings. وَأَنزَلَ مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابِ And he brought down to them the book, the book of truth. لِيَحْكُمُ بَيْنَ النَّاسُ فِي مَخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ So that they can judge upon people, so that they can rule upon people based on what people have been differing amongst themselves. Allah here is, in, is saying in the Qur'an that mankind was what? But then after that, when mankind, after mankind, after Allah sent prophets as bringers of glad tidings and bringers of warnings, then people started to differ. Then Almighty Allah gave books, gave revelation to prophets and messengers so that they can rule and so that they can judge among people based on the differences that they had amongst themselves. That is what happened. So in the beginning of time, human beings were one. There was never sects. There was never religions. There was never groupings. It was just one in the beginning of time. And in many of my discussions, which is something maybe off topic, of course, but I'll, let me just entertain it for now, for today, inshallah. But among these prophets, or the first of these prophets, was Adam alayhi salam. And him being the first prophet, Allah Almighty made sure that there were other human beings before him. <coughs> There were other human beings before him. So the human beings that were before Adam, as this is the theory that we believe in, we believe that Adam is not the first human being, but rather Adam is the first prophet. So the human beings that existed before Adam alayhi salam, were ordinary human beings that were not of a strong rational capability. Their rationality and their intellect was of a uh, was at its infancy. So then Allah sent a prophet. He sent prophets. So the prophets were the ones who elevated the consciousness, who elevated the rationality and elevated the intellect of mankind. And one of those prophets or the first prophet was Adam alayhi salam. So Allah says, when people developed rationality, that's when people started differing. When people had prophets, had messengers, had thinkers, had scientists, had scholars, had architects, had uh, engineers, had mathematicians. Because the prophets, this is what they were. They were the ones who introduced various sciences. All the sciences, they come from the prophets. They don't come from uh, any other people. All of the sciences, mathematics, Pyth uh, you know, the Pythagorean theorem, all of these things, they come from prophets, from divinely appointed individuals. So 
that is when mankind started to differ. That is what the Quran says. And that is how sects came about. And the development of human intellect. Now I'm going to, I'm becoming a little bit philosophical, but bear with me, inshallah. I will, I will go into the topic. So the development of the intellect automatically brings about differences. Automatically brings about, pro probably sometimes can bring about disputes, can bring about, brings about argumentation, brings about uh, a variety of views and understanding. Because that is what intellectual, intellectual discourse is all about. When there is stagnation, and when there is a constant understanding of one principle, of one thing, or looking at the world monolithically, then that is a sign and that is a proof of a very unintellectual nation, of a very undeveloped nation, a nation that hasn't grown yet. When a nation has uniformity, that is a nation that is not a successful nation. But a nation, for instance, that has architects, that has artists, that has uh, martial artists, that has painters, that has writers, that has uh, uh, chefs, uh, that has uh, cu culinary artists, and so on and so forth. That is a nation that is developing in intellect, that is coming about with uh, innovative ideas to come up with various things. And that is how sects came about. Sects came about as a result of intellectual development. Lack of intellectual development actually leads to not having sects. And that is why if you look at uh, various people that deal with companies and that deal with uh, organizing a number of individuals in an organization or a company or a construction company and so on and so forth, they will all tell you that it is extremely easy to run and to organize uh, unintelligent people to do the same thing, to order them around, to say that, hey, guys, this is what I want. I want X, Y, Z. It's very easy. As opposed to bringing, up, bringing about intelligent people, 100 intelligent people to work on a particular goal. So 100 people who are not so intelligent, they will be able to do things the way you want them to do. However, they will not understand the depth of the goal that it is that you're trying to achieve. As opposed to intelligent people, if you have 100 intelligent people, it's going to be very difficult to make, it's going to be very difficult to work with them, to let them actually work harmoniously going to be extremely difficult but they might see the vision and they might see the goal that you what, that you want to achieve but not so intelligent people don't see that goal so this is the double-edged sword so working with intelligent people the difficulty is that they understand the goal they understand whatever it is that you're trying to achieve but to actually put them in check and to make them to do whatever it is that you want them to do is extremely difficult so that is the nature of sex as well. People developed intellect. People were starting to become intelligent and innovative and thinking about ideas. And they decided that, look, this is what I want to do. We are gatherers. We are not hunters. And then the hunters were like, okay, we are also hunters. And then, then after a while, there were people who said that, okay, we are engineers. We deal with uh, engineering things. Then later on, there came other people. They said that, okay, we are mathematicians. And then later on came other people that said that, okay, we are poets. And then there are other people who said that, okay, we are culinary artists. We are chefs. We are cooks. We bring food to people. And then later on came people who said that we are chemists. And then later on came these people and these people and so on and so forth. So that is how sects actually came about from the beginning of time. That is how groupings actually came about through the development of intellect and reasoning and rationality and thinking. Now, the question that we need to answer, the other question that we need to answer is, 
<coughs> Excuse me. Does Islam have sects and does Islam have denominations and does it have groups and so on and so forth? And the answer is yes, absolutely. And a typical example where Allah mentions this in the Quran, Allah does say that there are sects and there are groups in the Quran. In Surah Al Mu'minun, Allah says, Wa inna hadihi ummatukum ummatan wahida. And surely this your religion or and surely this nation of yours is but one nation. And I am your Lord, so fear me. And then in the following verse, in verse number 53, Allah says, And then they cut uh, from the affair. They cut from the matter or from the mission. Between themselves, they cut from the affair. Zubura, into groups, into parties. And then Allah says, Kullu hizbin bima ladayhim farihoon. And every party and every group is proud of what it possesses. Kullu hizbin bima ladayhim farihoon. Every group is proud of what it possesses. And you can see it everywhere around the world. The Democrats are proud of what they have. The Republicans are proud of what they have. Independent Party has, is proud of what they have. EFF is proud of what it has. ANC is proud of what it has. The DA is proud of what it has. The COPE has a proud, is proud of what it has, and so on and so forth. ZANU-PF is proud of what it, ha it has, and MDC is proud of what it has. So that's what Allah says. Allah says that there are groups, there are parties. People have divided themselves, and people have grouped themselves. So, another example where Allah speaks about uh, sects and denominations another matter, or let me rather address this matter and that is the matter of other verses of the Quran that speak about how sects and denominations how groups developing or coming about is a sign of rational development if you look at in surah hud verse number 118 allah says if god willed he would have made mankind to be one nation but they still differ among themselves. They will still have differences and they still differ even until today. That's what the Quran says. And then it further says in the following verse in 119, verse number 119, إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكْ Except the one whom God has mercy on. وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُ And that is why Allah created them. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ and the word of Allah was completed. So Allah here says, except for those whom Allah has shown mercy. And for this, he created them. What did he create them? So that they might differ. Allah created mankind so that they must differ. We must differ. That's what Allah says in the Quran. Allah says the purpose of our creation is that we must differ. We must have differences. If we don't have differences, that's not a sign of development. That's not a sign of progress. That's a sign of regress. That's a sign of stagnation. And the verse that we quoted in the beginning of our talk is in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, Allah then sent prophets so that they might tell the differences among the people, so that they might judge among the people among their differences. That, hey, this difference is that you have, it's not a minor difference, it's not an issue. You know, okay, this, this one, this type of a difference, okay, that one is a bit problematic. You know, and the group that is correct regarding this matter is this group. Okay, when it comes to this matter, you guys, okay, you guys are all having a problematic issue when it comes to this one, but it can be solved, and so on and so forth. 
So that is how sects and that is how groups and denominations came about. Another reason why sects and denominations come about is as a result of people reacting to times, places, and situations. Time, place, and situation. As a result of people reacting to a particular time or to a particular place or to a particular situation, people end up, <clears throat> people end up having a different extraction, a different expression of whatever it is that they believe in and of whatever rituals and habits that they have. So a typical example, let me not make an example with uh, particular religions. Let me just make a theoretical example or an example that doesn't even exist in reality because it will get me in trouble. But let's make an example with a person who finds themselves in the African continent, and as he finds himself in the African continent, being a victim of colonialism, and as a result of being a victim of colonialism, there isn't material, there isn't building material to use to actually build certain structures. Not to say that the people never had that civilization and that uh, architecture and masonry. They have had it. But as a result of colonialism, they do not have it anymore. And then as a result, what they do is that they come up with innovative methods. One of the innovative methods is that they take boloko, which is the dung of cow, because they deal with cattle. And as they deal with cattle, they take cow dung. As a result of taking cow dung, they mix it with water. After they mix it with water, they use it to polish the floor. And the reason why they do that is because they do not have advanced methods that they had before colonialism, or they lost it as a result of being slaves, as a result of being victims of colonialism. So as a result, what happens is that people start perceiving, rubbing, or polishing the floor with cow dung as a tradition. It becomes a culture. If you do not do that, what you end up being told is that you have lost your ways. You have lost the ways of your ancestors. You have lost your way. You are misguided. You're a, you're a bigot. Or, sorry, not a bigot, but you're a, a heathen. You have lost your ways. You should come back to the ways of your ancestors. So that's a typical example. So the similar, that is reacting to a particular place or to a particular situation or a particular time. So that is what happens when it comes to sects and denominations. An example of this is in Surah Al-A'raf. However, this is a proof that to embrace differences, to embrace groupings, is not a bad thing. It's not a terrible thing. Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 159, وَقَطَّعْنَاهُمْ إِثْنَتَيْ عَشَرَةَ أَسْبَاطًا أُمَمًا وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَىٰ إِذِ اسْتَسْقَىٰ قَوْمُهُ أَنِبْرِبْ عَصَاكَ الْحَجَرْ فَانْبَجَسَتْ مِنْهُ إِثْنَتَيْ عَشَرَ عَيْنًا Allah speaks about Bani Israel and He speaks about the 12 chiefs and the 12 princes of Bani Israel. He says, and from Musa, there is a people and there is a nation that guide towards the truth. And they also implement justice and they follow the truth wherever it goes. And we divided them into 12 tribes. Allah says we divided them. Allah says he's the one that divided them as nations. We made them into 12 nations and 12 tribes. And we revealed to Musa, and this is what we told Musa, when his people asked him for water or they asked him to be quenched, Place the staff on the rock. So they gushed from it 12 springs and 12 rivers. 12 rivers came from that rock. Each tribe knew exactly where to drink. 
Allah says he is the one that made Bani Israel into 12 tribes. Allah did not say that Bani Israel, you must all be one nation. Must all be one. Don't be divided. Allah says no. He knows that people differ. He knows that people are not the same. So when it came to this situation, Musa started realizing that, hey, these people, they are not of a similar nature and they are not of similar customs and they have similar ideas and they don't see things the same way. So naturally, let me divide these people into 12. Allah commanded him to do that. Now, coming to another part of this discussion, we come to the, depart, uh, to the part of the discussion that speaks about what is it that makes sects and denominations to be bad? And what is it that makes sects and denominations to be good? Or are we saying that it is, a go it is good to have sects and denominations? Or are we saying that it is bad? What is it that we are saying? According to the Holy Quran, Sects and denominations are not bad. But what is bad? But what is bad? Okay, mashallah, good question. I will answer it, inshallah. The verse of the Quran in Surah Al Rum answers this question. Verse number 32 it says, Walladina farraku dinahum. وَكَانُوا شِيَعَ كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ And of those who divided their religion and became sects, every sect or every group, rather, every group or every party is happy with what they possess. So that is what the verse says here in the Quran. It says, مِنَ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا Those who split their religion and then they became groups, Shi'an. So the Qur'an here is not against people being of different groups. But rather the Qur'an here is against people who split the religion. The religion of Islam has laws, has principles, and has teachings. Now, taking the religion of Islam and then deciding that, okay, what I am going to do is that I am going to take this aspect of the religion and I'm going to adopt it. That aspect of the religion belong, belongs to that sect and that denomination. This aspect of the religion belongs to that sect of the, uh, that sect of the religion or that side of the religion or that school of thought or that sect or that denomination. So that is what Allah is speaking out against. Allah then says in other verses of the Quran, in Surah Al-An'am, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعَةً لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ Surely they who divided their religion into parts or into sects, into Shia, you have no concern with them. By the way, the word Shia is the plural for the word Shia. So Allah says, don't make yourselves into many Shia. By the way. You have no concern with them, meaning you do not have to do anything with them. They are not your people. Those people who take the religion and break it down and split it into parts and say that this is us and that is you and that is this and that is who in different groups, the Holy Prophet, Allah says, the Holy Prophet, you are not of those people and you have nothing to do with such people. And then Allah says, Their affair is with Allah. And Allah 
will inform them of what they used to do. So that is Surah An'am, verse number 159. So now the bad aspect, what we can deduce from what I just said, is that to split the religion and say that, well, this is us, the Shia, we adopt this aspect of Islam, this aspect of the Quran, or this aspect of the religion. And then other group comes and says that we are the Salafi and we adopt this aspect of Islam and this aspect of the Quran. And then another group comes and we adopt this aspect and this part of Islam. That is the problem when it comes to uh, that, what, that comes to groupings with people being of different groups. But when it comes to, to this kind of a grouping, this is not bad. This is not wrong. This is a positive form of grouping and denomination. If I accept everything of Islam, I accept everything about the Quran from Al-Fatiha up until Surah Al-Nas. But however, as much as I accept the Quran for what it is, I decide to be an esoteric Muslim. An esoteric Muslim means being a mystic Muslim. It means being an in-depth Muslim. It means being a Gnostic Muslim. I am going to take every single verse of the Quran that speaks about whatever that it speaks about. And then I'm going to take it from the literal perspective and what the Quran itself is trying to say. And I am going to implement it in a spiritual, uh, in a spiritual journey. An example, this is what the mystics do. An example is... When the Prophet وسلم, says, the believer is a mirror to another believer. Well, obviously what this means is that a believer, when he sees another believer, he will correct his flaws. He will show him that, hey, look at yourself. You know, you have something here. You know, you have fix yourself. A believer works as a mirror for another believer. Al-mu'minu. Mir'atul mu'min. That's what the hadith says. The mystic, however, decides that, okay, I'm going to take this hadith and I'm going to use it in the following manner. Because the Holy Prophet says, Umirna nasa ala qadri uqulihim. We have been commanded to speak to people on their level of rationality. The mystic also then says, because the Holy Prophet says, Ash-shari'atu aqwali wa tariqatu afa'ali. The legislation is my speech, and the way is my actions, and the reality is my condition and my feeling. So what he does is that he takes a hadith that says, Al-mu'minu mir'atul mu'min, by going in its reality as a Opposed to going in its legislative meaning. How? It says that the word al-mu'min is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, المؤمن. He is al-mu'min. It's one of the names of Allah. So when the Holy Prophet is saying al-mu'min mir'atul mu'min the believer is like al-mu'min, is like Allah, or he is a mirror to Allah. When he sees himself, he sees Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mystic takes that very same hadith that the first person took, but he takes it and he goes into depth with it and says that, no, I am a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a man starts becoming a believer, starts performing the night prayer, starts fasting, starts doing the recommended acts, starts reading the Quran, starts purifying themselves, they end up becoming a mirror for Allah. They end up becoming a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is just an example. That you can be a grouping in this manner. You can be a grouping of a person who deals with the jurisprudential aspect of the Quran. Somebody who deals with the linguistic aspect of the Quran. 
somebody who deals with the mystic aspects of the Quran, somebody who deals with the historical aspects of the Quran, somebody who deals with the traditional aspects of the Quran, somebody who deals with the scientific, natural science, or natural scientific aspects of the Quran. So, وَأَوْحَيْنَا وَأَوْحَى رَبُّكَ إِلَى النَّحْلِ And and your Lord revealed to the bee أَنْ اِتَّخِذِي مِنَ الْجِبَالِ بُيُوتَ That he must take, when Allah revealed to the bee that it must take houses in the mountains and wherever, when, wherever that it finds places. You can look at it from a spiritual perspective and say that how beautiful is the creation of Allah that Allah speaks about the bee, that the bee has been revealed to, Allah has given it wahl. But a man who is a scientific person will tell you that Surah An-Nahl is verse number is chapter number sixteen of the Quran, and the verse that speaks about Nahl, it collecting bees, is sixteen words, and the chromosomes of a bee is sixteen. That person is looking at it from a scientific perspective. So there are different groups that can look at a at the religion of Islam at the Holy Quran from different angles and from different perspectives. There's nothing wrong in that. What happened is that when extremism, when extremism came into different groups, it became sectarianism. And then what happened is that you ended up having wars. You ended up, pe- you ended up having people saying that we dismiss your worldview. We dismiss your epistemology. Ours is the one that is correct and yours is wrong. No, the scientific guy is correct. The philosophical guy is correct. The Arabic linguist of Adabiyat and Naho and Swarf and Ilmul Bayan and Malaga and so on and so forth and Arabic rhetoric, he's also correct. The historian that looks at the verses of the Quran, that this verse happened historically in this particular geographic location, he is also correct. The whole idea is that you guys must work together. And that is why, if you look at a verse of the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, which is a verse that we quoted yesterday, and it's very important for us to actually ponder upon this verse. In verse number 113, Allah says, وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ Pay close attention to this verse. It will blow your mind. He says that the Jews say that the Christians have nothing. They are nothing. Christians tell the Jews that you are nothing. And the Jews say that the Christians, you are nothing. Pay close attention. They both read the book. They both read the book. They both read the book. Then Allah says, كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا, يع... لا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ And similarly, those who do not know say the same thing that they say. Those that do not know say the same thing that they say. I want you to ponder upon this. Allah is saying that the Jews and the Christians the Jews say that the Christians are misguided. The Christians say the Jews are misguided. But Allah says, but they read the book. Allah He said, Allah said they read the book. He did not say that they read their books. He said they read their book. Which means there's one book that they read. What does this remind you of? Which other groups are there that say that these people have nothing? These people have nothing and they read the same book. Pay close attention. Then Allah says, But قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ And those that do not know, they say the same thing that they don't know. That you are worthless, you are useless, your school of thought is actually baseless. And whereas the reality is this, is that not all, the entire school of thought, your entire school of thought is not infallible. The Shia school of thought is not infallible. 
The Sunni school of thought is not infallible. The Sufi school of thought is not infallible. The Wahhabi, the Salafi, whatever school of thought that you follow is not infallible. Yes, the Prophet is infallible. Yes, the Ahlul Bayt are infallible. But just because the Ahlul Bayt are infallible, it does not mean that the school of thought or the people that claim to be following them are on the school of thought that is infallible. No, it's not like that. There are matters where the Sunni ideology is correct. And there are certain matters where the Shia ideology is correct. And there are certain matters where this group is correct. And there are certain matters where this group is correct. And there are certain matters where, these group are, where this group is correct. Right now, there are certain matters where the Muslim feminists are correct. <laughs> so different groups can be correct when it comes to this matter. So this answers the question of are schools, okay, I guess I've, I'll have to re-emphasize the question again and maybe go through it again. But are all schools of thought and sects and denominations, are they all right? Are they all correct? And the answer is no. We answered this question yesterday about religion. We said that the only religion that is correct is the religion of Islam. Now, similarly, the only school of thought that is correct, naturally, I'm going to say that it is the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, because the Ahlul Bayt are infallible. The school of thought that is correct is the Ahlul Bayt school of thought. But does it mean, now don't get me wrong, does it mean that the people who follow the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt are correct? No, definitely not. But are Ahlul Bayt correct? 100%. 100%. Everything that the Ahlul Bayt said we must do, they are 100% correct. Everything that the Quran said we must do, 100% correct. So the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt is the school of thought that says, Quran, Ahlul Bayt, case closed. Sahaba, no. We don't, we don't really give that much importance to the Sahaba. We honor them, we respect them, but we honor them and respect them based on the fact that they were loyal to Ahlul Bayt. If they were disloyal to Ahlul Bayt, we do not honor them. So, do we believe that all sects and all denominations and all, are we omnists? We are, no, we are not omnists. No, we are not pluralists. We believe that there is one school of thought that is with the truth. Or that is closer to the truth than all of them. Rather, let's, let's rather say that that is the closest to all the other schools of thought, to the truth. And what we said in the verse of the Qur'an that we quoted in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 213, said, Allah says about these people, that kana nasu ummatan wahid, mankind was one. And then he sent prophets and he sent messengers and so on and so forth. And then people differed amongst each other. And the prophets were the ones who judged among these people as to who is right among their differences. Then Allah says later on in the verse, فَهَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا اخْتَلَفُوا and then God guided those who had faith, those who had believed, based on what they differed in. So to differ is not an issue. So there are people, there are always people that will always be guided based on differences. They differ with the other people. So we do believe that there is one denomination and there is one sect that is with Allah and that is accepted and that is the truth or that is closer to the truth rather. Let's rather say that. But now also let us come to the other aspect because yesterday we spoke about different religions that people of different religions can go to heaven. And we said that uh, people of people will go to heaven and hell based on their level of argumentation and proofs and and uh, and evidence and conviction, based on the conviction and the argumentation that they had. They have to be convinced with whatever that they, that is presented to them. That is it truth or is it falsehood? So now coming to that that issue, um, there is a hadith here. It's a very interesting hadith. 
it is from Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam and it is found in Al Khisal. Speaking about paradise, Jannah. The Imam says, Inna lil Jannati thamaniyati abwab. He says that paradise has eight doors. Paradise has eight doors. Uh, as to the authenticity of the hadith, it is very authentic, very sound, based on the ulama of Rijal. Uh, but uh, there is a topic for uh, there is something that I think I would discuss maybe outside the topic because there are a lot of people that are not specialists in this matter. But anyway, it's not important. He says there is a door in which there are eight doors to paradise. Jannah has eight doors. There is a door in which the prophets and the honest people, the Nabiyun and the Sadiqun, they will enter through that door. That is the first door. And then he says, وَبَابٌ يَدْخُلُ مِنْهُ الشُّهَدَاءُ وَالصَّالِحُونَ And then there is a door in which the shuhada, the witnesses, shuhada does not mean uh, martyrs or people that have been slain in the path. Rather, it means people who are witnesses, shuhada, والصَّالِحُونَ And the righteous people and the salihun. They will enter through this door. That is the second door. And then وَخَمْسَةُ أَبْوَابٌ يَدْخُلُ مِنْهَا شِيْعَتُنَا وَمُحِبُّونَ Then he says, and then five doors. Our followers and our lovers will enter through that door. That is the five doors. So meaning now we have seven doors. A long description, the Imam says, فَلَا أَزَالُ وَاقِفًا عَلَى الصَّرَاتُ أَدْعُوا وَأَقُولُ رَبِّي سَلِّمْ شِيْعَتِي وَمُحِبِّي وَأَنصَارِي وَمَنْ تَوَلَّانِي فِي دَارِ الدُّنْيَا then Imam Ali says that I will stand on that door and I will call and I will say, my Lord, protect my followers, my lovers, my helpers, and those who have, God, who have given me their authority and their guardianship in the dunya. And the hadith goes in, goes on, goes on, goes on. It says that they will be granted the authority to intercede. They will be granted the authority to intercede for... A number of people like 70,000, yeah, 70,000 neighbors and 70,000 relatives. And it goes on and so on and so forth. So now you get seven doors of paradise. And then the eighth door, listen to what Imam Ali says. He says, وَبَابٌ يَدْخُلُ مِنْهُ سَائِرُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ سَائِرُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And the eighth door is the door in which the rest of the Muslims shall enter. And then he says, مِمَّنْ يَشْحَدُ among them who witness, those who witness, among these Muslims, these are those who witness, an la ilaha illallah. Those who say, I bear witness that there is no deity except for God Almighty and except for Allah. They will enter paradise. Those are the eight doors. And then he says, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ فِي قَلْبِهِ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ مِنْ بُغْضِنَا أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ And there is not even an ounce or even an atom's weight of hatred for us, the holy household of the holy prophet So, this includes Sunnis, Shia, Wahhabi, Salafi, and various denominations of Islam. So all Muslims will enter paradise according to this hadith of Imam Ali It shows you that the mercy of Allah regarding people of various religions and of various denominations is very vast. Allah will accommodate everybody. Allah will accommodate 99.9999% of the human population or of the Muslim population as well. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us among those that have reached a very high position in stature, in the afterlife. We also ask that Allah makes us among those that are constantly seeking for the truth. Because it is not sufficient, brothers and sisters. It's not sufficient to say that, okay, I will go to paradise. But what's the use of wanting to go to paradise and you want to go to paradise through falsehood? Everybody wants to go to paradise while they experience the sweetness of the truth. We also want to taste the truth. So we ask that Allah grants us the sweetness of the truth, the sweetness of guidance, the sweetness of the Qur'an. وَآخِرَ دَعْوَانَا عَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ
Um, since uh, the, the the host is not uh, really present, I guess you can ask your question now, inshallah. If you have questions, you can ask. Whatever platform you are, just ask your question, and then I will answer the question, inshallah. Okay. So, so sectarianism, uh, sectarianism is belonging to a sect is, uh, is not good. Belonging to a denomination is not good. I think I need to clarify that. It's very important that I clarify that aspect. And belonging to a denomination and belonging to a group is not good. What is bad, it's not, it's not, it's bad to do that. But what is good is if, say, for instance, you say that But rather, what is bad is to say that you belong to a particular sect and to say that certain individuals are not with the truth and you're the only one that is with the truth. That is where the problem comes. So sectarianism is bad if you say, for instance, that every single thing that the Malikis, Shafi'is, Hanbalis, and Hanafis, everything that they say is falsehood and is batil, and they're all going to Jahannam. That the Shia are kuffar, whoever kills a Shia is going to Jannah. That is the problem when it comes to sectarianism. But when you say, I belong to this particular group, and the way I belong to this particular group, it is not in a manner whereby I dismiss the beliefs and the practices and the rituals of other individuals. It is a school of thought. It's a school of thought. That's all it is. In hip hop, there are different schools of thought. There are different music genres. How is it that you can enjoy reggae, you can enjoy kwaito, you can enjoy house, I'm a piano, you can enjoy hip hop, you can enjoy, you know, trap, you can enjoy uh, underground, boom, bap, 90s hip hop, you can enjoy different kinds of music genres. And it's not a problem. It's not an issue. That's all it is. It's just schools of thought. Schools of thought. There are schools of thought that look a lot at hadith and emphasize a lot on hadith. And the way they look at hadith is not the same. Like, for instance, in Saudi, the way they look at hadith is not the same that the, as, as, as in Misr, in Egypt, they will, in, Az, in Al-Azhar. The way they, they don't look at hadith the same way. In Saudi, they're very strong when it comes to rijal, to the chain of narrations. Uh, but when, whereas when you look at Egypt, they look at a lot at Diraya. They focus a lot on Diraya. Does it go in accordance to the Quran and so on and so forth? Does it go in accordance to the other ahadith that that are given precedence over other over other ahadith? So there are other schools of thought that are mystical by nature, like the Sufis. You know, they look a lot at the depth of the narrations, the depth of the verses of the Quran. Things. They focus on matters that are all over, that are all about elevating a person's spirituality, rather than matters, <coughs> rather than matters that are of jurisprudential significance. So, 
Then you get other schools of thought that focus a lot on jurisprudence. Then you get other schools of thought that focus a lot on Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet's household, which is the Shia school of thought that believes that the, school, the Prophet made it categorically clear that I leave, with you with two, I leave you with two things, the book and the household. And why is it that one you choose to love and not follow, but the other you choose to love and follow? The Quran you love and follow, but the Ahlul Bayt, you only choose to love, you don't follow. You know, so that is what we mean by schools of thought. And if you actually follow schools of thought like schools of thought, as opposed to following them as religions, they split their religion, they cut their religion in pieces. That is where the problem comes. That is where the problem with the Quran has. But to say that I belong to this group. It's not an issue. It's not a problem. You're not going to be punished. You're not going to go to hell. Not unless if you are convinced that this is the way of the truth. The way of the household, the way of the Prophet's household is the way of the truth. If you are really convinced and you decided not to do or not to implement and follow the Prophet's household, then of course, naturally, that's a different matter altogether, inshallah. Yeah, I think uh, I think the abs the host is absent. Um, maybe we should close it, inshallah, for now. Uh, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa taala guides us to the truth, inshallah, and makes us to be firm with the truth, to follow it, and to implement it, and make sure that we are not only believe, not only speak, but we actually we actually live. In, in accordance to the way of the truth, inshallah. I also have an announcement to make, which is an issue uh, regarding a uh, water drive. We have a water drive that is going to happen on Arba'in day, inshallah. So uh, if you want to know about it, you will either contact my brother, uh, Sheikh Hussein. Sheikh Hussein Nishinyani, you can contact him or you can contact me or you can contact any of the scholars who want, uh, if you want to contribute towards the water drive, inshallah, which will be happening in Arba'in in around September, around September the 17th or 16th or 18th, 16th, 17th or 18th, inshallah. And so, yeah, we're going to be having a water drive. Yeah. If you have questions, you can ask. If you don't have any questions, then inshallah we'll close the program. Yeah. I'll give you some few seconds. Let me just give you uh, 20 seconds to ask your question. If you don't have a question, then we'll close inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضة طوعا وتمتئه فيها طويلة رحمتك أرحم الراحمين آمين رب العالمين